Now, this term is not used very much due to how specific it is, but the act of dodging a spear made out of mistletoe is called a balderdash. Balder, known to most as the god who dies. Even his death, though, is controversial. Often people will blame his death on Loki, but that may or may not be the case, depending on your perspective. Interestingly, in poetic references we find discussing Baldur's death, Loki is not the one who is held primarily responsible for this famous event. That is, instead, Holthor, whose hand actually performs the deed. Baldur is a deity around which there is much confusion and misinformation. Was he worshipped in history? Is he simply a Jesus insert into the Norse myths? What exactly are his associations as a deity? How would he have been celebrated? Let's dive into these questions. Baldur is often framed as a god of light, perhaps a sun god of some kind, which might be a little confusing since sunlight seems to be the purview of soul in the sense of the star. Freyr too is a god of sunlight in the sense of the parting clouds which bring light to crops so that they may grow. But just as there are multiple storm gods and war gods in Norse myth, it follows that there could be many deities of sunlight. And it's true that he is described as fair in appearance and a bright light shines from him by Snorri. He is also described as pale white, which is interesting considering that the kenning the White God refers to Heimdallr, not Baldr. Snorri continues by saying that he lives in a place that I'm going to assume is pronounced Breithablik, which Snorri confirms is heaven and a place of purity. At least he did reside there. As said, he very famously dies and now resides in Helheim. The myths about Baldur are few and far between. He is mentioned, for example, in the myth of Scothi joining the Aesir, but he takes no actions in this myth and is simply casually mentioned as the object of Scothi's desire. He is also present in the Ragnarok myth, but his participation in this apocalyptic story hinges on Snorri's telling of the myth that he is most known for, which is the myth of his death. I say Snorri's telling because there's two versions of this story. The most popular version is the Icelandic telling from Snorri Starlason, in which Baldur's death triggers a series of events that leads to Ragnarok. In short, this is the story where Loki manipulates Holther into throwing sharpened mistletoe at Baldur. This, known to Loki and not known to Holther, was Baldur's only weakness, and therefore he dies. The other, lesser-known version is from Danish historian Saxo Grammaticus, and this version of the story is interesting because it is so wildly different. Holther and Baldr are in competition for the love of Nana, which leads to a war between their kingdoms. Holther very much intentionally kills Baldr with his sword, for which revenge is taken. And I'll leave notes in the description on where to find these two stories, and my videos covering them in greater detail. So, we have two stories of the same event written very close to one another in time. But these stories are from very different men, with very different reasons for writing, and very different approaches to the myths. Now, modern heathens will often express a preference for one version or the other. Saxo's story has more details. Snorri's is more theologically relevant. Saxo is overtly biased, and Snorri seems to have just made shit up sometimes, with motivations ranging from theological to political. It is a whole discussion, and we'll go into it. Let's start with Saxo for a second, because he's, you know, he's more fun. Saxo's version is notable because Loki is completely absent from the story. Saxo also engages in what is called euhemerism, which is the retelling of myths as historical events involving men instead of gods. Saxo was insistent that the gods were not gods, but in fact influential and powerful men in history. Odin, for example, he paints as a manipulative and powerful wizard who lived across multiple generations. And this wizard, and others like him, were foolishly worshipped by men which Saxo frames as part of the Danes' shameful past. But he excuses it, saying that even the Romans fell victim to such profane beings. Saxo's method of recording the myths involves painting the gods in a negative light as often as possible. And Baldur is, of course, no exception. Saxo frames Baldur as the son of Odin, who arrogantly attempts to force the woman Nana to marry him even though she has spoken her preference to marry Holther. Now, this is part of what makes Saxo's version interesting. Some roles are reversed. 
Nana is Baldur's devoted wife in Snorri's telling, but here she actively denies him. Holther is not demonized through the story at all, and is instead painted as a heroic figure, fighting against immeasurable odds and even facing off against Thor, depicted as the brutish henchman of the gods, and even defeating him. In this story, Holther stands against the gods, weds Nana, and defeats Baldur in single combat. However, Baldur's death is revenged by Bo, Saxo's version of Valley in the Icelandic tradition. Holther and Bo fight a duel in which Bo is victorious, killing Holther. Bo is carried home on his shield and dies of his wounds thereafter. Now, what can we learn from Saxo's version of this legend? As far as Baldur is concerned, we get a very limited picture. Saxo's telling of Baldur is likely a corruption of his character, as it is with nearly every deity he discusses. The legend as told by Saxo likely contains some reversals from whatever authentic legend there might have been. The story as told by pagans likely had a heroic Baldur and a villainous Holther. But alas, the story is lost to time. Pagans writing shit down challenge. In Scandinavia, challenge impossible. There's probably no rune left on the stones. Icelandic myth has some interesting support for this idea that Baldur was the hero and Holther was the villain. Holther is described in kennings, which are poetic references to the deity, as the adversary to Baldur. Vali is described as fulfilling his oath of revenge for Baldur's death by killing Holther and taking him to the funeral pyre. But this inspires a bit of confusion due to the famous elements of Snorri's story in which Baldur is killed by a sharpened plant that can't be sharpened. Seriously, you try and sharpen mistletoe. There's no wood, there's nothing to sharpen. I, I genuinely have no idea what Snorri had in his head or even if he knew what mistletoe actually looked like, which is actually a talking point within scholastic discussions on this matter that Snorri may have just had no idea what mistletoe was because it doesn't grow in Iceland. So he just kind of imagined that it could be made into a spear or a dart or something like that. There's some ideas that this may actually be a mistranslation of a magic sword. And in Saxo's version, Holfer kills Baldur with a sword, but it doesn't have a name, but may, who knows? Mistranslation may not be right. Misunderstanding might be better. Basically, there's a sword in an Icelandic saga called mistletoe, which could be a reference to Halter's sword. It could also be a reference to the death of Baldur. Maybe I, it's a reach. There's no way to be sure, but it's an idea that gets tossed around to try and explain this mystery as to why the heck mistletoe gets turned into a sharpened projectile because it just doesn't make any sense. History tangent for a bit. Much of what we have on Baldur is heavily dependent on who is writing about him. Christianization, cross-cultural influence, the political goals of the authors are all things we have to consider when looking at Baldur and any god, really. Saxo Grammaticus was a Danish historian and theologian, which explains why he's a smidge of a hater when it comes to the gods. Saxo modernized the myths according to his contemporary political and religious views and preserved a version of his cultural history for future generations. Snorri was an Icelandic politician, and this informs his writing. Both of these men write their works as a celebration of their people's history, but with subtly different motivations. Snorri's goals seem to be to increase his reputation in Iceland as much as possible, and his writing was a means to that end. His goal, ultimately, was to unite Iceland with the crown of Norway, conveniently with him as the Jarl of Iceland. And this informs his motivations when writing the Heimskringla, which was a massive Icelandic work celebrating the Norwegian monarchy, which flies in the face of the traditional Icelandic view of monarchies, which was, to put it lightly, generally negative. His Edda would connect Norse myth to the widely respected classics of antiquity and place him as a celebrated cultural guardian of Icelandic and Norse traditions, all written in the context of also celebrating Christianity. And this may inform why there are celebrated kennings for Jesus Christ in Snorri's Edda and why Baldr seems to have some similarities with Jesus, purity as a victim, dying and rising God and all that. There are other aspects to Snorri's rise to power, but his writing of the Edda and the gains to his reputation that came with it helped him in this path. But how did that whole Jarl thing turn out? Well, it turns out that it didn't go so well. The way that Snorri wanted to bring this about was through supporting a coup in Norway that would have resulted in our boy being appointed as the Icelandic Jarl. The coup failed, and this resulted in Snorri's assassination when the king's men found him in Iceland, hiding in his basement. <laughs> 
Taking the perspectives of these men into consideration can give us a little information about the deity that both of them seem to use as somewhat of a political football. Whereas Saxo would demonize Balder, Snorri does kind of the opposite with him and turns him into a sort of Norse Jesus. Balder is a blameless victim who suffers at the hand of the villainous Loki who uses those around him to bring about Balder's death. Loki's involvement here is interesting and controversial. The death of Balder is one of the main citations given by those who wish to villainize Loki and his followers, but references to Loki assigning blame for this act are both late and rare. More often, Hothar is the one who bears responsibility. Even in the context of the myth provided by Snorri, Icelandic law breaks down the assignment of responsibility. Hothar is the murderer by hand, whereas Loki is the murderer by conspiracy, which is ultimately the lesser charge. Now, Snorri attempts to shift some of this responsibility onto Loki by making Hothar blind and the unwitting subject of Loki's manipulation in his telling, thereby absolving Hothar of the perception of responsibility, at least to the reader. This is unique to Snorri's version and conflicts with numerous references to Hothar as the enemy of Balder, including those recorded by Snorri, which would suggest that a more authentic telling of Hothar and Balder would include their own rivalry between each other, as described by Saxo. Additionally, no one other than Snorri describes Hothar as blind, and it seems that Loki's involvement is a late development and may have even been an invention of Snorri's. There is some evidence of this. Snorri's Balder story, like a lot of Icelandic storytelling, seems to have significant influence from Irish storytelling. And in the case of the myth of Balder's death, it bears significant similarity to the death of Fergus, as described in my video on Vali and my video on Hothar. And in this story, one man manipulates his blind friend into throwing a sharpened wooden weapon into his rival. And the story is a direct mirror of Snorri's myth of the death of Balder. Now, this could have been a completely organic evolution to the mythic storytelling of Iceland, or it could have been an invention of Snorri's own hand. But as it stands, we will never know for sure. For an expanded discussion on this, I suggest checking out my videos on Valley and Hulther. In those videos, I go into both Snorri's and Saxo's versions of the death of Balder myth. Those and other videos related to this myth will be linked in the description below, along with some further reading if you want to dive into this for yourself. The stories do share some very strong commonalities. Here's a series of events that exist in both tellings. Holther's hand brings about Balder's death, and he is given the equipment in order to do so. Vali takes revenge. Balder is plagued with dreams for telling his death. And a prophecy surrounds Balder's death and revenge. And finally, Balder winds up in the possession of the goddess of death. I missed one, which we should also discuss, and that is Baldur's invincibility. There is a point in both of the Baldur myths in which he is perceived as invulnerable, which is common in stories about powerful warriors. Now, Snorri's story does not include a warrior aspect, but Saxo's certainly does. Saxo and Snorri attribute this to different causes. Now, Snorri's myth cites Frigg's effort as a concerned mother to make everything in the universe other than mistletoe swear an oath not to kill her son. And this exception proves fatal for Balder. Even though you can't sharpen it, Saxo's version discusses a special meal prepared for Balder that gives him invulnerability. Holther, however, is supplied with the tools to kill Balder. It is unclear, however, which magical item overpowers Balder's magic. Holther is supplied with a legendary sword, a glittering magical belt, and perhaps the same magical meal that Balder had all of which, or any one of which, could be credited with his ability to kill Balder. Saxo is unfortunately unclear. In the ancient world, this motif is pretty common. There are many figures who are near-invincible warriors with a single weakness that is later exploited in the story. Achilles comes to mind with his heel, which is later exploited by Paris with a poison arrow. Hothar plunges his sword into Balder's side, causing a wound so deep that it would ultimately end his life. And in Snorri's version, Hothar is unknowingly armed with mistletoe, Balder's single weakness. These commonalities are very interesting when trying to reconstruct a myth of Balder or what any worship of Balder might have looked like. From this commonality, we can construct that Balder was associated with some kind of warrior tradition. Whatever authentic elements there are in this story, it seems obvious that Balder the warrior is a part of it. These specifics, though, are largely lost, as they are with Bragi. 
However, fortunately, there are some other things that we can look at. In Laxadella's saga, a skald named Ulf Ugason attends a wedding feast, and as a gift he recites a poem describing the paintings in the hall. The poem is called the Hustrapa, and in the Hustrapa there are three scenes. One is Thor fighting Jormungandr, another depicting a struggle between Loki and Heimdall, and finally Baldur's funeral. Now, we only have an incomplete version of the Hustrapa preserved by Snorri, who uses it to point out examples of kennings and other poetic tools. The parts describing the funeral are disconnected. We only have a stanza here and there in lists of segments of other poems using similar poetic tools. Snorri was writing a handbook explaining Norse poetry, not collecting a compilation of Norse poetry. So this is the result. And these segments seem to be only parts of what was likely a vivid description of the funeral itself as deities arrived to take part. And this shows that while the tellings of the death of Baldur might be obscured and controversial, the funeral itself was an important central cultural symbol. Whatever Baldur's religious significance may have been, it seems to have revolved around his death and the funeral. Unfortunately, exploring this is obscured by Christianization. The importance of Baldur's death may have given rise to a Christianized Jesus-like Baldur who is resurrected, which likely plays into his involvement at the end of Ragnarok. But for me, the importance of Baldur is mostly within the funeral itself. Coming back to Snorri, we can learn a bit through the kennings for Baldur. Again, those poetic references that he preserves. Let's go through them. Kennings are valuable because they are basically poetic nicknames built around recognizable aspects of something or someone. And that can be a god, a human, a ship, a horse, a sword, battle, anything really. A kenning for the sun, for example, is sky shield. Battle might be spear storm. Men are often trees, so a battle tree might be a man with his shield and sword. Sometimes the word choices in these kennings show subtleties of older perspectives. Among Baldur's kennings, aside from things like the son of Odin and Frigg, or enemy of Holther, and husband of Nana, are things like hell's companion and god of lamentations. These names are interesting and seem to highlight Baldur's association with death and the funeral itself. Indeed, Baldur's funeral is one of the most vivid ritual descriptions that we have in myth, even if that description is only a few sentences long. Baldur is placed on a ship, and his wife Nana dies of grief and is placed on the pyre with him. The pyre is then lit, and a great fire begins. Thor consecrates the ship with Mjolnir, and that's when things get... Lit. Okay, that was dumb, but literally, <laughs> literally, a dwarf named Lit walks in front of Thor and Thor kicks him into the funeral fire. So yeah, Lit got um, lit. The funeral has a variety of attendees, including Jotnar, which is especially interesting. This shows that the Jotnar and the Aesir are not always at war, and that their relationship is far more subtle than is often assumed. Some modern practitioners seem to put forward that the Jotnar, or Etten, or Giants, or whatever it is that you want to call them, are always evil all the time, or something like that. And that's just not what bears out in the stories. There are far too many counterexamples, and this is one of them. In my video on Ermolther, I took a closer look at the aftermath of the death of Baldur. The gods lament the death of such a great deity, and Ermolther brokers a deal with the goddess of death, that if all things in the universe weep for Baldur, then he may be released from her possession. This fails due to Thok, a feminine Jotun who is said to be a shape-shifted Loki. She alone refuses to weep. But the consequence of this statement is the conclusion that all others, including Jotnar and Ettens, wept for Baldur. So, here's the frustrating part about looking at this funeral. The next step would be to take this account of the funeral and compare it to another. Saxo and Snorri both agree that there was a funeral for Baldur and that it was very important. Saxo's description, however, is shorter. This is what he said in full. His army gave him a royal funeral and buried his body in a mound erected for this purpose. The end. Saxo out. There's also the part where the mound turns into a geyser and floods the surrounding area, but that's not really important. Interestingly, there are some uses from this. To me, this shows a variety in the nature of funerary traditions of Baldur. Saxo gives him a mound, Snorri gives him a burning ship we see a variety of funerary practices across Norse culture. There are pyres, ship burials, wagon burials, mound burials, both with bodies and urns, accounts of burning ships, 
Most notably, there is Ibn Fadlan's detailed account of a funeral for a noble that includes the practice of a burning ship. And there seemed to be a variety of customs around death that changed with place and time. And it's probably the case that the story of Baldur's funeral might have changed based on the localized funerary traditions. Now, there is a post-Ragnarok image of Baldur. After the dust settles, Baldur and Hothar are resurrected and become buds. They remain after Ragnarok among the surviving gods and face new challenges, such as Nithog, who rises from the mountains, corpses falling from his feathers. The image of Ragnarok that we have seems to be a late addition, and the details around Baldur are quite limited and seem to be heavily Christianized. The story of Baldur seems to be a fulfillment of him as a Jesus figure, rather than any heathen image of the deity. And that gets us to the challenge of Baldur as a heathen deity. As a heathen, should Baldur be worshipped? Can Baldur be worshipped? Was he worshipped in history? Does his death mean that any worship of him is therefore inert? Now, there's a couple of things to think about here as far as what death means for a deity and in heathenry. So, let's take a look. In my experience, Baldur worship is present, but rare in modern heathenry. I'd say that the worship of Air, the goddess of physicians and healing, for whom we have far less information, is more common than the worship of Baldur. But I think that that's in part because a lot of heathens don't really know what to do with Baldur as far as worshiping him. Is he the deity of sunlight, death, rebirth, all of the above? And then there's his death, which complicates things even more. Scholarship doesn't really seem to be much help in this situation. Place names related to Baldur are controversial and may or may not indicate a historical cultus. There is a reference in the saga of Frithjof the Bold to a Baldur's meadow in Norway in which there is a temple with idols, and this temple is burned down and rebuilt as part of the saga, but the idea that this saga has connection with a realistic historical cultus has been largely abandoned, as are the fertility associations that came from that saga. Now, a number of ideas have been put forward to try and describe what a Baldur cultus may have looked like. There's a 10th century manuscript found in Germany briefly mentioning Odin, Suna, and others chanting charms to heal Baldur's horse, and this might be a reference to a continental tradition associating Baldur with healing, but again, it's his horse that is getting healed, he's not doing the healing, so this is, it, it's unclear. I'll give you my personal interpretation, because why the hell not? My personal interpretation of Baldur has more to do with the kennings that I mentioned earlier, the god of lamentations and companion of hell. And this places him as a death god for me, which wouldn't be strange as there are several death gods already in Norse myth. Odin and Freya are death deities associated with battle. Hell is a death goddess associated with the afterlife. Freyr is a death god associated with agriculture, government, and society. Njorthur seems to be a death god associated with the journey into the afterlife. This is already a lot, and it is not exhaustive. There are several others. Death is a complicated topic with a number of facets represented by many gods. And the Norse were surrounded, inundated by death, and Baldur seems to be a death god associated with dying and the funeral itself. This would mean that a modern heathen funeral might involve a small altar with a number of deities present on it, including deities important to the deceased, as well as Baldur. Baldur is the god of lamentations, who aids in grief, and the companion of hell, who would receive those who have died when they arrive. A story might be told of the deceased meeting Baldur and being welcomed by him. You could even extrapolate his illumination as a light seen by those on the journey to the underworld. Baldur the guiding light. These would be modern extrapolations, of course, but entirely reasonable ones. The story of Ermothar riding to Baldur gives us some interesting little bits of information as well. That even in death, Baldur has agency and gives gifts, Nana as well. In the story, after Ermothor has brokered a deal with Hell that would ultimately fail, Baldur walks Ermothor to Hell's gates, the act of a gracious host. He and Nana are then said to hand gifts to Ermothor, who brings them back to the gods, showing that death does not stop the cycle of reciprocity. Baldur gave the ring Dropnir to Odin, which Odin had placed on him during the funeral. Nana gave Frigg a linen robe, and to Fola she gave a finger ring. 
Snorri suggests that she gave other gifts as well, but does not name them. This, again, would be an extrapolation, but one might look at this and position Balder as a guardian of the ancestors, and include him on an ancestral altar as a deity that facilitates gifts from beyond the grave. Alternatively, this might be a way to view Ermothor as well, as the rider who carries gifts from the underworld. Again, these are modern extrapolations, but a reasonable way to view the myths in terms of your practice. So, as far as the worship of Baldur in light of his status as a dead god in myth, the fact that Baldur is dead doesn't seem to stop him from being a deity. Death for a deity doesn't carry the same meaning that it does for a human being. Much of what makes us human is our body, and death is an end to that. The gods, however, are disembodied minds. Death for Baldur seems to mean that he now resides in Helheim, and he cannot reside in Asgard, and thus is separated from the Aesir, hence their lamentations and attempt to broker a deal with Hell. The power of death and the balance of life and death won out in this story. But none of this, however, affects Baldur's godhood. The cycle of reciprocity and his involvement in people's lives remains unaffected. And in this way, death for Baldur is transformative as to his role. Baldur very clearly performs as a host in his interactions with Ermothor, which may translate to how he greets the deceased as a host welcoming a newcomer. Now, let's distinguish Baldur from Hel, the goddess of death, who is divided in two. Half of her is dead and half of her is living. And this communicates that while she is the goddess of death, she is not wholly dead, which allows her to traverse between worlds and be the master over the land of the dead. Baldur, on the other hand, is wholly dead, so his presence is restricted to Helheim. And while the Aesir may lament that he cannot be in Asgard with them, he is greeted in Helheim with celebration as Hel's friend and companion on the high seat. Now, this celebration may be replicated for others who enter the land of the dead. This is told of in the sagas as well. As I've mentioned several times on this channel, the story of Thorstein Codbiter in Erbia's saga involves a celebration very similar to that of Baldur. Thorstein is greeted by his father, who invites him to the high seat in celebration. Now, one might see Baldur filling a similar role for others, maybe those who did not have such a figure in their lives, celebrating their arrival in Helheim and inviting them to the high seat. I had largely ignored Baldur in my practice until I started doing some more deep dives on other deities. Snorri's image of Baldur honestly bored me, uh, and I put little stock in Ragnarok in its present form as even a cohesive myth, much less as something that is theologically relevant or that I need to worry about or whatever. But as I delved further and further into the myths of various deities such as Loki, Vali, and Hothar, I started getting a more interesting image of Baldur that takes from all of these little observations. The image of Baldur I now have is a tragic one. A warrior deity who fought for love and died for it. Vengeance was taken, but he remains dead. Finding himself in the underworld, his role as a deity is transformed. He and his love are now reunited in the underworld, where he serves as a host for the ancestors, celebrating their arrival. His illumination is a shining beacon for those who are on the journey to the land of the dead. He may aid in the ancestors, reaching out to us through dreams. Baldur is a god who is dead, but as a dead god who is still active, he shows us that death is not an ending but merely a transformation. So hail to Baldur, fallen warrior, god of lamentations, shining god, hell's companion, dream god. Before I take off, I've got something that I want to show you all. It's been a minute since I've made a video, but y'all out there continue to subscribe and watch vids. And so many of y'all reached out to let me know that you wanted more videos, whether it was in the comment section, over Discord, or Instagram, or otherwise. And I want to let y'all know that I appreciate it and it has helped me recover from burnout. But also, we've passed 100K. We've passed 100,000 subscribers. And YouTube has done sent me a play button in all of its silver glory. So thank you so much for sticking around, everyone. It means everything. But with that, hail to my patrons for making this content possible.
It's good to have people at your back. Be sure to like the vid if you enjoyed it, and the subscribe button and the like button have unlocked a portal to another world. Don't click them unless you are prepared. Be sure to ring the bell for more heathen content, and remember to find a way or make one. Look, I would have said that making this video made me balder, that is the obvious pun, but I don't think anyone would believe me.